Chapter 4 What? I blink fast, disbelieving. I've always told you, Warner says to me, that we would make an excellent team. I've always said that I've been waiting for you to be ready, for you to recognize your anger, your own strength. I've been waiting since the day I met you. But you wanted to use me for the reestablishment. You wanted me to torture innocent people. Not true. What? What are you talking about? You told me yourself. I lied. He shrugs. My mouth has fallen open. There are three things you should know about me, love. He steps forward. The first, he says, is that I hate my father more than you might ever be capable of understanding. He clears his throat. Second, is that I am an unapologetically selfish person who in almost every situation makes decisions based entirely on self-interest. And third, a pause as he looks down, laughs a little. I never had any intention of using you as a weapon. Words have failed me. I sit down, numb. That was an elaborate scheme I designed entirely for my father's benefit, Warner says. I had to convince him it would be a good idea to invest in someone like you, that we might utilize you for military gain, and to be quite, quite honest, I'm still not sure how I managed it. The idea is ludicrous, to spend all that time, money, and energy on reforming a supposedly psychotic girl just for the sake of torture. He shakes his head. I knew from the beginning it would be a fruitless endeavor, a complete waste of time. There are far more effective methods of extracting information from the unwilling. Then why, why did you want me? His eyes are jarring in their sincerity. I wanted to study you. What? I gasp. He turns his back to me. Did you know, he says, so quietly I have to strain to hear him, that my mother lives in that house? He looks to the closed door. The one my father brought you to? The one where he shot you? She was in her room just down the hall from where he was keeping you. When I don't respond, Warner turns to face me. Yes, I whisper. Your father mentioned something about her. Oh? Alarm flits in and out of his features. He quickly masks the emotion. And what, he says, making an effort to sound calm, did he say about her? That she's sick. I tell him, hating myself for the tremor that goes through his body. That he stores her there because she doesn't do well in the compounds. Warner leans back against the wall, looking as if he requires the support. He takes a hard breath. Yes, he finally says. It's true. She's sick. She became ill very suddenly. His eyes are focused on a distant point in another world. When I was a child, she seemed perfectly fine, he says, turning and turning the jade ring around his finger. But then one day she just fell apart. For years, I fought my father to seek treatment, to find a cure, but he never cared. I was on my own to find help for her, and no matter who I contacted, no doctor was able to treat her, no one, he says, hardly breathing now, knew what was wrong with her. She exists in a constant state of agony, he says, and I've always been too selfish to let her die. He looks up. And then I heard about you. I heard stories about you, rumors, he says, and it gave me hope for the very first time. I wanted access to you. I wanted to study you. I wanted to know and understand you firsthand, because in all my research, you were the only person I'd ever heard of who might be able to offer me answers about my mother's condition. I was desperate, he says. I was willing to try anything. What do you mean? I ask. How could someone like me be able to help you with your mother? His eyes find mine again, bright with anguish. Because, love, you cannot touch anyone, and she, he says, cannot be touched.
Chapter 5 I've lost the ability to speak. I finally understand her pain, Warner says. I finally understand what it must be like for her, because of you. Because I saw what it did to you, what it does to you. To carry that kind of burden, to exist with that much power, and to live among those who do not understand. He tilts his head back against the wall, presses the heels of his hands to his eyes. She, much like you, he says, must feel as though there is a monster inside of her. But unlike you, her only victim is herself. She cannot live in her own skin. She cannot be touched by anyone, not even by her own hands. Not to brush a hair from her forehead or to clench her fists. She's afraid to speak, to move her legs, to stretch her arms, even to shift to a more comfortable position, simply because the sensation of her skin brushing against itself causes her an excruciating amount of pain. He drops his hands. It seems, he says, fighting to keep his voice steady, that something in the heat of human contact triggers this terrible, destructive power within her. And because she is both the originator and the recipient of the pain, she's somehow incapable of killing herself. Instead, she exists as a prisoner in her own bones, unable to escape this self-inflicted torture. My eyes are stinging hard. I blink fast. For so many years, I thought my life was difficult. I thought I understood what it meant to suffer. But this? This is something I can't even begin to comprehend. I never stopped to consider that someone else might have it worse than I do. It makes me feel ashamed for ever having felt sorry for myself. For a long time, Werner continues. I thought she was just sick. I thought she'd developed some kind of illness that was attacking her immune system, something that made her skin sensitive and painful. I assumed that with the proper treatment, she would eventually heal. I kept hoping, he says, until I finally realized that years had gone by and nothing had changed. The constant agony began to destroy her mental stability. She eventually gave up on life. She let the pain take over. She refused to get out of bed or to eat regularly. She stopped caring about basic hygiene. And my father's solution was to drug her. He keeps her locked in that house with no one but a nurse to keep her company. She's now addicted to morphine and has completely lost her mind. She doesn't even know me anymore. Doesn't recognize me. And the few times I've ever tried to get her off the drugs, he says, speaking quietly now. She's tried to kill me. He's silent for a second, looking as if he's forgotten I'm still in the room. My childhood was almost bearable sometimes, he says, if only because of her. And instead of caring for her, my father turned her into something unrecognizable. He looks up, laughing. I always thought I could fix it, he says. I thought if I could only find the root of it. I thought I could do something. I thought I could... He stops, drags a hand across his face. I don't know, he whispers, turns away. But I never had any intention of using you against your will. The idea has never appealed to me. I only had to maintain the pretense. My father, you see, does not approve of my interest in my mother's well-being. He smiles a strange, twisted sort of smile, looks toward the door, laughs. He never wanted to help her. She is a burden he is disgusted by. He thinks that by keeping her alive, he's doing her a great kindness for which I should be grateful. He thinks this should be enough for me, to be able to watch my mother turn into a feral creature so utterly consumed by her own agony she's completely vacated her mind. He runs a shaky hand through his hair, grips the back of his neck. But it wasn't, he says quietly. It wasn't enough. I became obsessed with trying to help her, to bring her back to life. And I wanted to feel it, he says to me, looking directly into my eyes. I wanted to know what it would be like to endure a pain like that. I wanted to know what she must experience every day. 
I was never afraid of your touch, he says. In fact, I welcomed it. I was so sure you would eventually strike out at me that you would try to defend yourself against me, and I was looking forward to that moment. But you never did. He shakes his head. Everything I'd read in your files told me you were an unrestrained, vicious creature. I was expecting you to be an animal, someone who would try to kill me and my men at every opportunity, someone who needed to be closely watched, but you disappointed me by being too human, too lovely, so unbearably naive. You wouldn't fight back. His eyes are unfocused, remembering. You didn't react against my threats. You wouldn't respond to the things that mattered. You acted like an insolent child, he says. You didn't like your clothes. You wouldn't eat your fancy food. He laughs out loud and rolls his eyes, and I've suddenly forgotten my sympathy. I'm tempted to throw something at him. You were so hurt, he says, that I'd asked you to wear a dress. He looks at me then, eyes sparkling with amusement. Here I was, prepared to defend my life against an uncontrollable monster who could kill, he says. Kill a man with her bare hands. He bites back another laugh. And you threw tantrums over clean clothes and hot meals. Oh, he says, shaking his head at the ceiling. You were ridiculous. You were completely ridiculous, and it was the most entertainment I'd ever had. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. I loved making you mad, he says to me, his eyes wicked. I love making you mad. I'm gripping one of his pillows so tightly I'm afraid I might tear it. I glare at him. He laughs at me. I was so distracted, he says, smiling, always wanting to spend time with you, pretending to plan things for your supposed future with the reestablishment. You were harmless and beautiful, and you always yelled at me, he says, grinning widely now. God, you would yell at me over the most inconsequential things, he says, remembering. But you never laid a hand on me. Not once, not even to save your own life. His smile fades. It worried me. It scared me to think you were so ready to sacrifice yourself before using your abilities to defend yourself. A breath. So I changed tactics. I tried to bully you into touching me. I flinch, remembering that day in the blue room too well, when he taunted me and manipulated me and I came so close to hurting him. He'd finally managed to find exactly the right things to say to hurt me enough to want to hurt him back. I nearly did. He cocks his head, exhales a deep, defeated breath. But that didn't work either. And I quickly began to lose sight of my original purpose. I became so invested in you that I'd forgotten why I'd brought you on base to begin with. I was frustrated that you wouldn't give in, that you refused to lash out even when I knew you wanted to. But every time I was ready to give up, you would have these moments, he says, shaking his head. You had these incredible moments when you'd finally show glimpses of raw, unbridled strength. It was incredible. He stops, leans back against the wall. But then you'd always retreat, like you were ashamed, like you didn't want to recognize those feelings in yourself. So I changed tactics again. I tried something else, something that I knew with certainty would push you past your breaking point. And I must say, it really was everything I hoped it would be. He smiles. You looked truly alive for the very first time. My hands are suddenly ice cold. The torture room, I gasp. Chapter Six I suppose you could call it that. Warner shrugs. We call it a simulation chamber. You made me torture that child, I say to him, the anger and the rage of that day rising up inside of me. How could I forget what he did, what he made me do? 
the horrible memories he forced me to relive all for the sake of his entertainment. I will never forgive you for that. I snap, acid in my voice. I will never forgive you for what you did to that little boy, for what you made me do to him. Warner frowns. I'm sorry, what? You would sacrifice a child? My voice is shaking now. For your stupid games? How could you do something so despicable? I throw my pillow at him. You sick, heartless monster! Warner catches the pillow as it hits his chest, staring at me like he's never seen me before. But then a kind of understanding settles into place for him, and the pillow slips from his hands, falls to the floor. Oh, he says, so slowly. He's squeezing his eyes shut, trying to suppress his amusement. Oh, you're going to kill me, he says, laughing openly now. I don't think I can handle this. What are you talking about? What's wrong with you? I demand. He's still smiling as he says, Tell me, love. Tell me exactly what happened that day. I clench my fists, offended by his flippancy and shaking with renewed anger. You gave me stupid, skimpy clothes to wear, and then you took me down to the lower levels of Sector 45 and locked me in a dirty room. I remember it perfectly, I tell him, fighting to remain calm. It had disgusting yellow walls, old green carpet, a huge two-way mirror. Warner raises his eyebrows, gestures for me to continue. Then you hit some kind of switch, I say, forcing myself to keep talking. I don't know why I'm beginning to doubt myself. And these huge metal spikes started coming out of the ground, and then I hesitate, stealing myself. A toddler walked in. He was blindfolded. And you said he was your replacement. You said that if I didn't save him, you wouldn't either. Warner is looking at me closely now, studying my eyes. Are you sure I said that? Yes. Yes. He cocks his head. Yes, you saw me say that with your own eyes. No, I say quickly, feeling defensive. But there were loudspeakers. I could hear your voice. He takes a deep breath. Right, of course. I did, I tell him. So after you heard me say that, what happened? I swallow hard. I had to save the boy. He was going to die. He couldn't see where he was going, and he was going to be impaled by those spikes. I had to pull him into my arms to try to find a way to hold on to him without killing him. A beat of silence. And did you succeed? Warner asks me. Yes, I whisper, unable to understand why he's asking me this when he saw it all happen for himself. But the boy went limp, I say. He was temporarily paralyzed in my arms, and then you hit another switch, and the spikes disappeared, and I let him down, and he... He started crying again, and bumped into my bare legs, and he started screaming, and I... I got so mad at you. That you broke through concrete, Warner says, a faint smile touching his lips. You broke through a concrete wall just to try and choke me to death. You deserved it, I hear myself say. You deserved worse. Well, he sighs. If I did, in fact, do what you say I did, it certainly sounds like I deserved it. What do you mean, if you did? I know you did. Is that right? Of course it's right. Then tell me, love, what happened to the boy? What? I freeze. Icicles creep up my arms. What happened, he says, to that little boy? You say that you set him on the ground, but then you proceeded to break through a concrete wall fitted with a thick six-foot-wide mirror, with no apparent regard for the toddler you claim was wandering around the room. Don't you think the poor child would have been injured in such a wild, reckless display? My soldiers certainly were. 
You broke down a wall of concrete love. You crushed an enormous piece of glass. You did not stop to ascertain where the blocks or the shattered bits had fallen or who they might have injured in the process. He stops, stares. Did you? No, I gasp, blood draining from my body. So what happened after you walked away? He asks, or do you not remember that part? You turned around and left, just after destroying the room, injuring my men, and tossing me to the floor. You turned around, he says, and walked right out. I'm numb now, remembering. It's true. I did. I didn't think. I just knew I needed to get out of there as fast as possible. I needed to get away to clear my head. So what happened to the boy? Warner insists. Where was he when you were leaving? Did you see him? A lift of his eyebrows. And what about the spikes, he says. Did you bother to look closely at the ground to see where they might have come from? Or how they might have punctured a carpeted floor without causing any damage? Did you feel the surface under your feet to be shredded or uneven? I'm breathing hard now, struggling to stay calm. I can't tear myself away from his gaze. Juliet, love he says softly. There were no speakers in that room. That room is entirely soundproof. Equipped with nothing but sensors and cameras, it is a simulation chamber. No, I breathe, refusing to believe, not wanting to accept that I was wrong, that Warner isn't the monster I thought he was. He can't change things now, can't confuse me like this. This isn't the way it's supposed to work. That's not possible. I am guilty, he says, of forcing you to undergo such a cruel simulation. I accept the fault for that, and I've already apologized for my actions. I only meant to push you into finally reacting, and I knew that sort of recreation would quickly trigger something inside of you. But good God, love. He shakes his head. You must have an absurdly low opinion of me if you think I would steal someone's child just to watch you torture it. It wasn't real? I don't recognize my own raspy, panicked voice. It, it wasn't real? He offers me a sympathetic smile. I designed the basic elements of the simulation. But the beauty of the program is that it will evolve and adapt as it processes a soldier's most visceral responses. We use it to train soldiers who must overcome specific fears or prepare for a particularly sensitive mission. We can recreate almost any environment, he says. Even soldiers who know what they're getting into will forget that they're performing in a simulation. He averts his eyes. I knew it would be terrifying for you. And I did it anyway. And for hurting you, I feel true regret. But no, he says quietly, meeting my eyes again. None of it was real. You imagined my voice in that room. You imagined the pain, the sounds, the smells. All of it was in your mind. I don't want to believe you, I say to him, my voice scarcely a whisper. He tries to smile. Why do you think I gave you those clothes, he asks. The material of that outfit was lined with a chemical designed to react to the sensors in that room. And the less you're wearing, the more easily the cameras can track the heat in your body, your movements. He shakes his head. I never had a chance to explain what you'd experienced. I wanted to follow you immediately, but I thought I should give you time to collect yourself. It was a stupid decision on my end. His jaw tenses. I waited, and I shouldn't have. Because when I found you, it was too late. You were ready to jump out a window just to get away from me. For good reason, I snap. He holds up his hands in surrender. You are a terrible person, I explode, throwing the rest of the pillows at his face, angry and horrified and humiliated all at once. Why would you put me through something like that when you know what I've been through, you stupid, arrogant... Juliet, please. 
he says, stepping forward, dodging a pillow to reach for my arms. I am sorry for hurting you, but I really think it was worth. Don't touch me! I jerk away, glaring, clutching the foot of his bed like it might be a weapon. I should shoot you all over again for doing that to me. I should, I should... What? He laughs. You're going to throw another pillow at me? I shove him hard, and when he doesn't budge, I start throwing punches. I'm hitting his chest, his arms, his stomach, and his legs, anywhere I can reach, wishing more than ever that he weren't able to absorb my power, that I could actually crush all the bones in his body and make him writhe in pain beneath my hands. You selfish monster! I keep throwing poorly aimed fists in his direction, not realizing how much the effort exhausts me, not realizing how quickly the anger dissolves into pain. Suddenly, all I want to do is cry. My body is shaking in both relief and terror, finally unshackled from the fear that I'd caused another innocent child some kind of irreparable damage, and simultaneously horrified that Warner would ever force such a terrible thing on me, to help me. I'm so sorry, he says, stepping closer. I really truly am. I didn't know you then, not like I do now. I'd never do that to you now. You don't know me, I mumble, wiping away tears. You think you know me just because you've read my journal, you stupid, prying, privacy-stealing asshole. Oh, right. About that, he smiles, one quick hand plucking the journal out of my pocket as he moves toward the door. I'm afraid I wasn't finished reading this. Hey! I protest, swiping at him as he walks away. You said you'd give that back to me. I said no such thing, he says, subdued, dropping the journal into his own pants pocket. Now please wait here a moment. I'm going to get you something to eat. I'm still shouting as he closes the door behind him. Chapter 7 I fall backward onto the bed and make an angry noise deep inside my throat, chuck a pillow at the wall. I need to do something. I need to start moving. I need to finish forming a plan. I've been on the defense and on the run for so long now that my mind has often been occupied by elaborate and hopeless daydreams about overthrowing the reestablishment. I spent most of my 264 days in that cell fantasizing about exactly this kind of impossible moment. The day I'd be able to spit in the face of those who oppressed me and everyone else just beyond my window. And though I dreamed up a million different scenarios in which I would stand up and defend myself, I never actually thought I'd have a chance to make it happen. I never thought I'd have the power, the opportunity, or the courage. But now... Everyone is gone. I might be the only one left. At Omega Point, I was happy to let Castle lead. I didn't know much about anything, and I was still too scared to act. Castle was already in charge and already had a plan, so I trusted that he knew best, that they knew better. A mistake. I've always known deep down who should be leading this resistance. I've felt it quietly for some time now, always too scared to bring the words to my lips. Someone who's got nothing left to lose and everything to gain. Someone no longer afraid of anyone. Not Castle, not Kenji, not Adam, not even Warner. It should be me. I look closely at my outfit for the first time and realize I must be wearing more of Warner's old clothes. I'm drowning in a faded orange t-shirt and a pair of gray sweatpants that almost falls off my hips every time I stand up straight. I take a moment to regain my equilibrium, testing my full weight on the thick, plush carpet under my bare feet. I roll the waistband of the pants a few times, just until they sit snugly at my hip bone, and then I ball up the extra material of the t-shirt and knot it at the back. I'm vaguely aware that I must look ridiculous, but fitting the clothes to my frame gives me some modicum of control, and I cling to it. It makes me feel a little more awake, a little more in command of my situation. All I need now is a rubber band. My hair is too heavy, it's begun to feel like it's suffocating me, and I'm desperate to get it off my neck. I'm desperate to take a shower, actually. 
I spin around at the sound of the door. I'm caught in the middle of a thought, holding my hair up with both hands in a makeshift ponytail, and suddenly acutely aware of the fact that I'm not wearing any underwear. Warner is holding a tray. He's staring at me, unblinking. His gaze sweeps across my face, down my neck, my arms, stops at my waist. I follow his eyes only to realize that my movements have lifted my shirt and exposed my stomach, and I suddenly understand why he's staring. The memory of his kisses along my torso, his hands exploring my back, my bare legs, the back of my thighs, his fingers hooking around the elastic band of my underwear. Oh, I drop my hands and my hair at the same time, the brown waves falling hard and fast around my shoulders, my back hitting my waist. My face is on fire. Warner is suddenly transfixed by a spot directly above my head. I should probably cut my hair, I say to no one in particular, not understanding why I've even said it. I don't want to cut my hair. I want to lock myself in the toilet. He doesn't respond. He carries the tray closer to the bed, and it's not until I spot the glasses of water and the plates of food that I realize exactly how hungry I am. I can't remember the last time I ate anything. I've been surviving off the energy recharge I received when my wound was healed. Have a seat, he says, not meeting my eyes. He nods to the floor before folding himself onto the carpet. I sit down across from him. He pushes the tray in front of me. Thank you, I say, my eyes focused on the meal. This looks delicious. There's tossed salad and fragrant, colorful rice, diced seasoned potatoes and a small helping of steamed vegetables, a little cup of chocolate pudding, a bowl of fresh-cut fruit, two glasses of water. It's a meal I would have scoffed at when I first arrived. If I knew then what I know now, I would have taken advantage of every opportunity Warner had given me. I would have eaten the food and taken the clothes. I would have built up my strength and paid closer attention when he showed me around base. I would have been looking for escape routes and excuses to tour the compounds, and then I would have bolted. I would have found a way to survive on my own, and I never would have dragged Adam down with me. I never would have gotten myself and so many others into this mess. If only I had eaten the stupid food. I was a scared, broken girl, fighting back the only way I knew how. It's no wonder I failed. I wasn't in my right mind. I was weak and terrified and blind to the idea of possibility. I had no experience with stealth or manipulation. I hardly knew how to interact with people, could barely understand the words in my own head. It shocks me to think how much I've changed in these past months. I feel like a completely different person, sharper somehow, hardened absolutely, and for the first time in my life, willing to admit that I'm angry. It's liberating. I look up suddenly, feeling the weight of Warner's gaze. He's staring at me like he's intrigued, fascinated. What are you thinking about? He asks. I stab a piece of potato with my fork. I'm thinking I was an idiot for ever turning down a plate of hot food. He raises an eyebrow at me. I can't say I disagree. I shoot him a dirty look. You were so broken when you got here, he says, taking a deep breath. I was so confused. I kept waiting for you to go insane, to jump on the table at dinner and start taking swipes at my soldiers. I was sure you were going to try and kill everyone. And instead, you were stubborn and pouty, refusing to change out of your filthy clothes and complaining about eating your vegetables. I go pink. At first, he says laughing, I thought you were plotting something. I thought you were pretending to be complacent just to distract me from some greater goal. I thought your anger over such petty things was a ruse, he says, his eyes mocking me. I figured it had to be. I crossed my arms. The extravagance was disgusting. So much money is wasted on the army while other people are starving to death. Warner waves a hand, shaking his head. That's not the point. The point, he says, is that I hadn't provided you with any of those things for some calculated underhanded reason. 
It wasn't some kind of test. He laughs. I wasn't trying to challenge you and your scruples. I thought I was doing you a favor. You'd come from this disgusting, miserable hole in the ground. I wanted you to have a real mattress, to be able to shower in peace, to have beautiful, fresh clothes, and you needed to eat, he says. You'd been starved half to death. I stiffen, slightly mollified. Maybe, I say, but you were crazy. You were a controlling maniac. You wouldn't even let me talk to the other soldiers. Because they are animals, he snaps, his voice unexpectedly sharp. I look up, startled to meet his angry, flashing green eyes. You, who have spent the majority of your life locked away, he says, have not had the opportunity to understand just how beautiful you are, or what kind of effect that can have on a person. I was worried for your safety, he says. You were timid and weak and living on a military base full of lonely, fully armed, thick-headed soldiers three times your size. I didn't want them harassing you. I made a spectacle out of your display with Jenkins because I wanted them to have proof of your abilities. I needed them to see that you were a formidable opponent, one they'd do well to stay away from. I was trying to protect you. I can't look away from the intensity in his eyes. How little you must think of me. He shakes his head in shock. I had no idea you hated me so much, that everything I tried to do to help you had come under such harsh scrutiny. How can you be surprised? What choice did I have but to expect the worst from you? You were arrogant and crass, and you treated me like a piece of property because I had to. He cuts me off, unrepentant. My every move, every word is monitored when I am not confined to my own quarters. My entire life depends on maintaining a certain type of personality. What about that soldier you shot in the forehead, Seamus Fletcher? I challenge him, angry again. Now that I've let it enter my life, I'm realizing anger comes a little too naturally to me. Was that all a part of your plan too? No, wait, don't tell me. I hold up a hand. That was just a simulation, right? Warner goes rigid. He sits back. His jaw twitches. He looks at me with a mixture of sadness and rage in his eyes. No, he finally says, deathly soft. That was not a simulation. So you have no problem with that? I ask him. You have no regrets over killing a man for stealing a little extra food, for trying to survive just like you? Warner bites down on his bottom lip for half a second, clasps his hands in his lap. Wow, he says. How quickly you jump to his defense. He was an innocent man, I tell him. He didn't deserve to die, not for that, not like that. Seamus Fletcher, Warner says calmly staring into his open palms, was a drunken bastard who was beating his wife and children. He hadn't fed them in two weeks. He'd punched his nine-year-old daughter in the mouth, breaking her two front teeth and fracturing her jaw. He beat his pregnant wife so hard she lost the child. He had two other children too, he says. A seven-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl. A pause. He broke both their arms. My food is forgotten. I monitor the lives of our citizens very carefully, Warner says. I like to know who they are and how they're thriving. I probably shouldn't care, he says, but I do. I'm thinking I'm never going to open my mouth ever again. I have never claimed to live by any set of principles, Warner says to me. I've never claimed to be right or good or even justified in my actions. The simple truth is that I do not care. I have been forced to do terrible things in my life, love, and I am seeking neither your forgiveness nor your approval, because I do not have the luxury of philosophizing over scruples when I'm forced to act on basic instinct every day. He meets my eyes. Judge me, he says, all you like, but I have no tolerance he says sharply, for a man who beats his wife, 
No tolerance, he says, for a man who beats his children. He's breathing hard now. Seamus Fletcher was murdering his family, he says to me. And you can call it whatever the hell you want to call it, but I will never regret killing a man who would bash his wife's face into a wall. I will never regret killing a man who would punch his nine-year-old daughter in the mouth. I am not sorry, he says, and I will not apologize. Because a child is better off with no father, and a wife is better off with no husband than one like that. I watch the hard movement in his throat. I would know. I'm sorry, Warner. I... He holds up a hand to stop me. He steadies himself, his eyes focused on the plates of untouched food. I've said it before, love, and I'm sorry I have to say it again, but you do not understand the choices I have to make. You don't know what I've seen and what I'm forced to witness every single day. He hesitates. And I wouldn't want you to. But do not presume to understand my actions, he says, finally meeting my eyes. Because if you do, I can assure you you'll only be met with disappointment. And if you insist on continuing to make assumptions about my character, I'll advise you only this. Assume you will always be wrong. He hauls himself up with a casual elegance that startles me, smooths out his slacks, pushes his sleeves up again. I've had your armoire moved into my closet, he says. There are things for you to change into, if you'd like that. The bed and bathroom are yours. I have work to do, he says. I'll be sleeping in my office tonight. And with that... He opens the adjoining door to his office and locks himself inside. Chapter 8 My food is cold. I poke at the potatoes and force myself to finish the meal even though I've lost my appetite. I can't help but wonder if I finally pushed Warner too far. I thought the revelations had come to a close for today, but I was wrong again. It makes me wonder just how much is left and how much more I'll learn about Warner in the coming days, months. And I'm scared. Because the more I discover about him, the fewer excuses I have to push him away. He's unraveling before me, becoming something entirely different, terrifying me in a way I never could have expected. And all I can think is not now, not here, not when so much is uncertain. If only my emotions would understand the importance of excellent timing. I never realized Warner was unaware of how deeply I detested him. I suppose now I can better understand how he saw himself, how he'd never viewed his actions as guilty or criminal. Maybe he thought I would have given him the benefit of the doubt, that I would have been able to read him as easily as he's been able to read me. But I couldn't. I didn't. And now I can't help but wonder if I've managed to disappoint him somehow. Why I even care. I clamor to my feet with a sigh, hating my own uncertainty. Because while I might not be able to deny my physical attraction to him, I still can't shake my initial impressions of his character. It's not easy for me to switch so suddenly, to recognize him as anything but some kind of manipulative monster. I need time to adjust to the idea of Warner as a normal person. But I'm tired of thinking, and right now all I want to do is shower. I drag myself toward the open door of the bathroom before I remember what Warner said about my clothes, that he'd moved my armoire into his closet. I look around, searching for another door and finding none but the locked entry to his office. I'm half tempted to knock and ask him directly, but decide against it. Instead, I study the walls more closely, wondering why Warner wouldn't have given me instructions if his closet was hard to find. But then I see it. A switch. It's more of a button, actually, but it sits flush with the wall. It would be almost impossible to spot if you weren't actively searching for it. I press the button. A panel in the wall slides out of place, and as I step across the threshold, the room illuminates on its own. This closet is bigger than his entire bedroom. 
The walls and ceiling are tiled with slabs of white stone that gleam under the fluorescent recessed lighting. The floors are covered with thick oriental rugs. There's a small suede couch the color of light green jade stationed in the very center of the room. But it's an odd sort of couch. It doesn't have a back. It looks like an oversized ottoman. And strangest of all, there's not a single mirror in here. I spin around, my eyes searching, certain I must have overlooked such an obvious staple, and I'm so caught up in the details of the space that I almost miss the clothes. The clothes. They're everywhere, on display as if they were works of art. Glossy dark wood units are built into the walls, shelves lined with rows and rows of shoes. All the other closet space is dedicated to hanging racks, each wall housing different categories of clothing. Everything is color-coordinated. He owns more coats, more shoes, more pants and shirts than I've ever seen in my life. Ties and bow ties, belts, scarves, gloves and cufflinks, beautiful rich fabrics, silk blends and starched cotton, soft wool and cashmere dress shoes and buttery leather boots buffed and polished to perfection, a pea coat in a dark burnt shade of orange, a trench coat in a deep navy blue, a winter toggle coat in a stunning shade of plum. I dare to run my fingers along the different materials, wondering how many of these pieces he's actually worn. I'm amazed. It's always been apparent that Warner takes pride in his appearance. His outfits are impeccable. His clothes fit him like they were cut for his body. But now I finally understand why he took such care with my wardrobe. He wasn't trying to patronize me. He was enjoying himself. Aaron Warner Anderson, chief commander and regent of Sector 45, son of the supreme commander of the reestablishment. He has a soft spot for fashion. After my initial shock wears off, I'm able to easily locate my old armoire. It's been placed unceremoniously in a corner of the room, and I'm almost sorry for it. It stands out awkwardly against the rest of the space. I quickly shuffle through the drawers, grateful for the first time to have clean things to change into. Warner anticipated all of my needs before I arrived on base, the armoire is full of dresses and shirts and pants, but it's also been stocked with socks, bras, and underwear. And even though I know this should make me feel awkward, somehow it doesn't. The underwear is simple and understated. Cotton basics that are exactly average and perfectly functional. He bought these things before he knew me, and knowing that they weren't purchased with any level of intimacy makes me feel less self-conscious about it all. I grab a small t-shirt, a pair of cotton pajama bottoms, and all of my brand new underthings and slip out of the room. The lights immediately switch off as soon as I'm back in the bedroom, and I hit the button to close the panel. I look around his bedroom with new eyes, reacclimating to this smaller, standard sort of space. Warner's bedroom looks almost identical to the one I occupied while on base, and I always wondered why. There are no personal effects anywhere, no pictures, no odd knickknacks, but suddenly it all makes sense. His bedroom doesn't mean anything to him. It's little more than a place to sleep, but his closet, that was his style, his design. It's probably the only space he cares about in this room. It makes me wonder what the inside of his office looks like, and my eyes dart to his door before I remember how he's locked himself inside. I stifle a sigh and head toward the bathroom, planning to shower, change, and fall asleep immediately. This day felt more like a few years, and I'm ready to be done with it. Hopefully tomorrow we'll be able to head back to Omega Point and finally make some progress. But no matter what happens next, and no matter what we discover, I'm determined to find my way to Anderson, even if I have to go alone. Chapter 9 I can't scream. My lungs won't expand. 
My breaths keep coming in short gasps. My chest feels too tight and my throat is closing up and I'm trying to shout and I can't. I can't stop wheezing, thrashing my arms and trying desperately to breathe, but the effort is futile. No one can hear me. No one will ever know that I'm dying, that there's a hole in my chest filling with blood and pain and such unbearable agony, and there's so much of it, so much blood, hot and pooling around me, and I can't, I can't, I can't breathe. Juliet, Juliet, love, wake up, wake up. I jerk up so quickly I double over. I'm heaving in deep, harsh, gasping breaths, so overcome, so relieved to be able to get oxygen into my lungs that I can't speak, can't do anything but try to inhale as much as possible. My whole body is shaking. My skin is clammy, going from hot to cold too quickly. I can't steady myself, can't stop the silent tears, can't shake the nightmare, can't shake the memory. I can't stop gasping for air. Warner's hands cup my face. The warmth of his skin helps calm me somehow, and I finally feel my heart rate begin to slow. Look at me, he says. I force myself to meet his eyes, shaking as I catch my breath. It's okay, he whispers, still holding my cheeks. It was just a bad dream. Try closing your mouth, he says, and breathing through your nose. He nods. There you go. Easy. You're okay. His voice is so soft, so melodic, so inexplicably tender. I can't look away from his eyes. I'm afraid to blink, afraid to be pulled back into my nightmare. I won't let you go until you're ready, he tells me. Don't worry. Take your time. I close my eyes. I feel my heart slow to a normal beat. My muscles begin to unclench. My hands steady their tremble. And even though I'm not actively crying, I can't stop the tears from streaming down my face. But then something in my body breaks, crumples from the inside, and I'm suddenly so exhausted I can no longer hold myself up. Somehow, Warner seems to understand. He helps me sit back on the bed, pulls the blankets up around my shoulders. I'm shivering. Wiping away the last of my tears, Warner runs a hand over my hair. It's okay, he says softly. You're okay. Aren't you going to sleep too? I stammer, wondering what time it is. I notice he's still fully dressed. I, yes, he says. Even in this dim light, I can see the surprise in his eyes. Eventually. I don't often go to bed this early. Oh, I blink, breathing a little easier now. What time is it? Two o'clock in the morning. It's my turn to be surprised. Don't we have to be up in a few hours? Yes. The ghost of a smile touches his lips. But I'm almost never able to fall asleep when I should. I can't seem to turn my mind off. He says, grinning at me for only a moment longer before he turns to leave. Stay. The word escapes my lips even before I've had a chance to think it through. I'm not sure why I've said it. Maybe because it's late and I'm still shaking, and maybe having him close might scare my nightmares away. Or maybe it's because I'm weak and grieving and need a friend right now. I'm not sure. But there's something about the darkness, the stillness of this hour, I think, that creates a language of its own. There's a strange kind of freedom in the dark, a terrifying vulnerability we allow ourselves at exactly the wrong moment, tricked by the darkness into thinking it will keep our secrets. We forget that the blackness is not a blanket. We forget that the sun will soon rise. But in the moment, at least, we feel brave enough to say things we'd never say in the light. Except for Warner, who doesn't say a word. For a split second, he actually looks alarmed, He's staring at me in silent terror, too stunned to speak, and I'm about to take it all back and hide under the covers when he catches my arm. I still. He tugs me forward until I'm nestled against his chest. His arms fall around me carefully, as if he's telling me I can pull away, that he'll understand that it's my choice. But I feel so safe, 
so warm, so devastatingly content that I can't seem to come up with a single reason why I shouldn't enjoy this moment. I press closer, hiding my face in the soft folds of his shirt, and his arms wrap more tightly around me, his chest rising and falling. My hands come up to rest against his stomach, the hard muscles tensed under my touch. My left hand slips around his ribs, up his back, and Warner freezes, his heart racing under my ear. My eyes fall closed just as I feel him try to inhale. Oh, God, he gasps. He jerks back, breaks away. I can't do this. I won't survive it. What? He's already on his feet, and I can only make out enough of his silhouette to see that he's shaking. I can't keep doing this. Warner! I thought I could walk away the last time, he says. I thought I could let you go and hate you for it, but I can't. Because you make it so damn difficult, he says. Because you don't play fair. You go and do something like get yourself shot, he says. And you ruin me in the process. I try to remain perfectly still. I try not to make a sound. But my mind won't stop racing, and my heart won't stop pounding, and with just a few words, he's managed to dismantle my most concentrated efforts to forget what I did to him. I don't know what to do. My eyes finally adjust to the darkness, and I blink, only to find him looking into my eyes like he can see into my soul. I'm not ready for this. Not yet. Not yet. Not like this. But a rush of feelings, images of his hands, his arms, his lips are charging through my mind, and I try but can't push the thoughts away, can't ignore the scent of his skin and the insane familiarity of his body. I can almost hear his heart thrumming in his chest, can see the tense movement in his jaw, can feel the power quietly contained within him, and suddenly his face changes, worries. What's wrong? He asks. Are you scared? I startle, breathing faster, grateful he can only sense the general direction of my feelings and not more than that. For a moment, I actually want to say no. No, I'm not scared. I'm petrified. Because being this close to you is doing things to me, strange things and irrational things, and things that flutter against my chest and braid my bones together. I want a pocket full of punctuation marks to end the thoughts he's forced into my head. But I don't say any of those things. Instead, I ask a question I already know the answer to. Why would I be scared? You're shaking, he says. Oh. The two letters and their small, startled sound run right out of my mouth to seek refuge in a place far from here. I keep wishing I had the strength to look away from him in moments like this. I keep wishing my cheeks wouldn't so easily inflame. I keep wasting my wishes on stupid things, I think. No, I I'm not scared, I finally say. But I really need him to step away from me. I really need him to do me that favor. I'm just surprised. He's silent, then, his eyes imploring me for an explanation. He's become both familiar and foreign to me in such a short period of time, exactly and nothing like I thought he'd be. You allow the world to think you're a heartless murderer, I tell him. And you're not. He laughs once, his eyebrows lift in surprise. No, he says. I'm afraid I'm just the regular kind of murderer. But why, why would you pretend to be so ruthless, I ask? Why do you allow people to treat you that way? He sighs, pushes his rolled up shirt sleeves above his elbows again. I can't help but follow the movement, my eyes lingering along his forearms. And I realize for the first time that he doesn't sport any military tattoos like everyone else. I wonder why. What difference does it make? He says. People can think whatever they like. I don't desire their validation. So you don't mind? I ask him. The people judge you so harshly? I have no one to impress. He says. No one who cares about what happens to me. I'm not in the business of making friends, love. 
My job is to lead an army, and it's the only thing I'm good at. No one, he says, would be proud of the things I've accomplished. My mother doesn't even know me anymore. My father thinks I'm weak and pathetic. My soldiers want me dead. The world is going to hell, and the conversations I have with you are the longest I've ever had. What? Really? I ask, eyes wide. Really? And you trust me with all this information? I say. Why share your secrets with me? His eyes darken, deaden all of a sudden. He looks toward the wall. Don't do that, he says. Don't ask me questions you already know the answers to. Twice I've laid myself bare for you, and all it's gotten me was a bullet wound and a broken heart. Don't torture me, he says, meeting my eyes again. It's a cruel thing to do, even to someone like me. Warner. I don't understand. He breaks, finally losing his composure, his voice rising in pitch. What could Kent, he says, spitting the name, possibly do for you? I'm so shocked, so unprepared to answer such a question, that I'm rendered momentarily speechless. I don't even know what's happened to Adam, where he might be or what our future holds. Right now, all I'm clinging to is a hope that he made it out alive, that he's out there somewhere, surviving against the odds. Right now, that certainty would be enough for me. So I take a deep breath and try to find the right words, the right way to explain that there are so many bigger, heavier issues to deal with. But when I look up, I find Warner is still staring at me, waiting for an answer to a question I now realize he's been trying hard to suppress. Something that must be eating away at him. And I suppose he deserves an answer, especially after what I did to him. So I take a deep breath. It's not something I know how to explain, I say. He's, I don't know. I stare into my hands. He was my first friend, the first person to treat me with respect, to love me. I'm quiet a moment. He's always been so kind to me. Warner flinches, his eyes widen in shock. He's always been so kind to you? Yes. I whisper. Warner laughs a harsh, hollow sort of laugh. This is incredible, he says, staring at the door, one hand caught in his hair. I've been consumed by this question for the past three days, trying desperately to understand why you would give yourself to me so willingly, just to rip my heart out at the very last moment for some, some bland, utterly replaceable automaton. I kept thinking that there had to be some great reason, something I'd overlooked, something I wasn't able to fathom. And I was ready to accept it, he says. I'd forced myself to accept it, because I figured your reasons were deep and beyond my grasp. I was willing to let you go if you'd found something extraordinary. Someone who could know you in ways I'd never be able to comprehend, because you deserve that, he says. I told myself you deserved more than me, more than my miserable offerings. He shakes his head. But this, he says, appalled. These words, this explanation, you chose him because he's kind to you? Because he's offered you basic charity? I'm suddenly angry. I'm suddenly mortified. I'm outraged by the permission Warner granted himself to judge my life, that he thought he'd been generous by stepping aside. I narrow my eyes, clench my fists. It's not charity, I snap. He cares about me, and I care about him. Warner nods, unimpressed. You should get a dog, love. I hear they share much the same qualities. You are unbelievable. I shove myself upward, scrambling to my feet and regretting it. I have to cling to the bed frame to steady myself. My relationship with Adam is none of your business. Your relationship? Warner laughs, loud. He moves quickly to face me from the other side of the bed, leaving several feet between us. What relationship? Does he even know anything about you? Does he understand you? 
Does he know your wants, your fears, the truth you conceal in your heart? Oh, and what, you do? You know damn well that I do, he shouts, pointing an accusatory finger at me. And I'm willing to bet my life that he has no idea what you're really like. You tiptoe around his feelings, pretending to be a nice little girl for him, don't you? You're afraid of scaring him off. You're afraid of telling him too much. You don't know anything. Oh, I know, he says, rushing forward. I understand perfectly. He's fallen for your quiet, timid shell, for who you used to be. He has no idea what you're capable of, what you might do if you're pushed too far. His hand slips behind my neck. He leans in until our lips are only inches apart. What is happening to my lungs? You're a coward, he whispers. You want to be with me and it terrifies you and you're ashamed, he says. Ashamed you could ever want someone like me, aren't you? He drops his gaze and his nose grazes mine, and I can almost count the millimeters between our lips. I'm struggling to focus, trying to remember that I'm mad at him, mad about something, that his mouth is right in front of mine and my mind can't stop trying to figure out how to shove aside the space between us. You want me, he says softly, his hands moving up my back. And it's killing you. I jerk backward, breaking away, hating my body for reacting to him, for falling apart like this. My joints feel flimsy. My legs have lost their bones. I need oxygen, need a brain, need to find my lungs. You deserve so much more than charity, he says, his chest heaving. You deserve to live. You deserve to be alive. He's staring at me, unblinking. Come back to life, love. I'll be here when you wake up.